Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Donica. We've heard a lot in the news about our next topic, the opioid epidemic, and various half-hearted political attempts to quote-unquote combat it. And well, we should, because there have been over 68,000 drug overdose deaths in 2018, over 47,000 of which involved opioids, and over 31,000 of which involve synthetic, uh, synthetic opioids. And yes, we're gonna discuss what's the difference, such as fentanyl and tramadol. To put this all in perspective, this is 50% more than all the deaths last year from breast cancer, all the deaths from gunshot wounds, and all the deaths from automobile accidents, each of which hover around 40,000 deaths per year. Now, most American adults know someone who has died from opioid addiction or overdose. I personally am thinking with sorrow about the loss of three adult children from close friends of mine. Most of us are worried about the opioid epidemic and its impact, but our next guest is actually doing something about it. She's on the front lines doing something radical, providing compassionate medical care for people struggling with addiction. Dr. Elizabeth Ryan is Associate Medical Director leading the primary care department at Reach Medical, a nonprofit organization based in Ithaca, New York, which is also her hometown. Reach opened in early 2018 to respond to the opioid crisis. It is committed to bringing compassion and health equity to people who are typically underserved, stigmatized, and marginalized. Reach is pioneering a model of low threshold healthcare where philosophies of harm reduction and trauma-informed care guide the integration of treatment for substance use disorders, behavioral health, primary care, infectious disease prevention and treatment, and multiple social supports. Dr. Ryan returned to Ithaca in 2014 after completing medical school at Boston University and then a family medicine residency as chief resident and a geriatrics fellowship at Swedish First Hill in, in Seattle. She completed her National Health Service Corps scholarship commitment locally in small upstate New York towns, serves as an adjunct faculty member at SUNY Upstate School of Medicine, sits on the Public Health Commission for New York State Academy of Family Physicians, as well as the Substance Abuse Subcommittee for the Board of Tompkins County Mental Health. When time allows, she writes articles for the arm, online harm reduction magazine, Filter. She is married and the mother of two children. So with that schedule, we are thrilled that she was able to make time to come talk to us today. Welcome to the ladies room, Liz. Thanks, great to be here. So is this the first time you've ever done an interview in a ladies room? It is the first time. Yeah, it's the first one that, that I called an interview. Yes. Well, we are <laughs> flattered. Uh, I usually ask our guests that aside from this, what's the most unique, different, or memorable uh, experience you ever had in a ladies' room? Oh, my gosh. Um, there are several stories from college that I won't bring up. Oh, come on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot to mention in your intro that uh, for college, you went to Princeton University, which is also my alma yeah. mater, and I'm wearing orange and black in your honor. Go Tigers. Yeah. So come on, share uh, one college bathroom story. Oh my gosh, a college bathroom story. This actually may be hard. Um, well, uh, well, I, I, I used the wrong bathroom. Um, <laughs> it was, this is terribly untimely given recent Texas events, but I um, quite innocently went into the wrong floor of my dorm room after coming home from the clubs and um, used a downstairs neighbor's bathroom and then woke him up on the way out. Uh -huh. and, and, and we both got awfully confused and went home with a little bit of shame. <laughs> I think everybody has a uh, went into the wrong bathroom story yep. somewhere along the line. Yep. Uh, but today we're obviously going to talk about something more serious and I really appreciate you taking the time. What I want to start out with is a vocab lesson uh, because sure. I think people are really confused even about basic information like what opioids are. And sometimes we hear about the opioid addiction, sometimes we hear about opiates. So you wanna start with what are opioids and what's the difference between opioids yeah. and opiates? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think it's actually not, um, 
that question rarely comes up for me, right? So um, in an interesting way, even though I'm very much in this world of drug use um, and, and treating addiction um, and use disorders, um, to an extent, I don't really care exactly what people have in their systems. Um, and I think that's one of the, the sort of um, key parts of what we do is that we say whatever you've been using, whether it's you know some synthetic thing that was made in you know a lab in in Asia or or in somebody's trailer behind the homeless encampment, um, you know the only reason that we would do a urine screen to see what somebody has been taking um, is to make sure that they're at least attempting to take the treatment that we're giving them um, and to start conversations about um, what they're struggling with. So if we see, you know, morphine or um, an unspecified opiate, um, I rarely get into that with patients, um, except for the fact that we talk about the dangers of unpredictable opiates that, that people get by accident. Um, so one of the main dangers of, of being someone who uses drugs is that you're often in situations where you're not exactly sure what you're putting in your body. Um, and yet you have a very strong drive to do so. Um, so just so that you know, people understand what we're talking about. Somebody asked me the question the other day, a yeah. uh, very well-meaning question, Whatever happened to narcotics? We used to hear all about narcotics, and now we're just hearing about opiates. Right. And basically, they're the same thing. They're opiates the same thing. And narcotics are the same thing. Yeah. Narcotics also include opioids, which are the mm -hmm. synthetic or partially synthetic uh, compounds. Opiates are just derived from opium. And, and I think more yeah. natural. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the natural stuff. Um, yeah, and I think you know the word narcotics is also at least in sort of law enforcement circles has just come to meant like come to mean drug enforcement so it's sort of like it can be used perhaps wrongly as a catch-all term um but yeah I, i'm i'm mostly in uh in the narcotics business so, <laughs> yep. so when yep. we talk about opiates we're talking about drugs like morphine and heroin when we're talking about opioids we're talking about drugs like uh, fentanyl, uh, oxycontin, uh, right. hydrocodone. Right. Um, interestingly, mm -hmm. I read a very interesting study uh, from 2013 from Pain magazine, or the, the journal Pain, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, surveyed over 3,000 addicts and asked them if they could have their drug of choice, uh, which would they prefer if oh, money and access were not issues. Uh, and the majority of, of people said Oxycontin, uh, although they said that in real life, hydrocodone was easier to get, but they yeah. disliked hydrocodone because more often when they got it, it was mixed with acetaminophen or Tylenol. Right. Um, and they're afraid of getting liver damage from the Tylenol, which right. is really right. a kind of interesting paradox. And very often when we're treating patients in the hospital for severe acute pain, we limit the amount of these drugs, not right. because of the narcotic, but because of the Tylenol. Which yep. is kind yep. of an interesting, uh, interesting controversy. So how did you get into this uh, kind of a practice in the first place? Yeah, this is, it, it, was a, it was a pretty indirect, fortuitous route for me. I uh, came home in 2014 and was doing sort of normal family practice, uh, um, doing rural health and basically just sort of cutting my teeth and getting the skills, building my, my doctor's kit. Um, and um, have always gravitated, even before I got into medicine, towards sort of finding, you know, I'm a big, like, supporter of the underdog and, and looking for ways to right wrongs and, and serve people who aren't, aren't getting the help they need. Um, so my National Health Service Corps time when I was working in small towns around this upstate area, um, I started to get a flavor of medically what was going on in my home region. So I saw quite a bit of 
of people with, with substance use disorders and didn't really have the tools to help them. Um, and, and I almost siloed that. I said, you know, I, I, there are some structural limitations that are in place to treating substance use disorders that we can get into a little bit. Um, but it, it really meant that I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel I could do a good job out of one person or one and a half person practice. Um, and so honestly, the, the reach for me was born out of um, a post-Trump election liberal panic. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, You're in a safe place here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel it. Um, so, you know, I, I have lots of friends around town from growing up and from all, all different stages of life as I've sort of dipped back into my, my Ithaca roots over the years. Um, and so when Trump got elected, we had, a, we gathered a group of different kinds of healthcare and mental health providers to talk about what our plan would be locally if some of the major components of the social service network dropped out. So, you know, if Obamacare was completely overturned on, you know, day 11 of this new presidency, uh, what would we do? What, what, what impact would that have on our local community if people lost health insurance? Um, and we already knew that our, in our area, as in many areas, there's a huge shortage of behavioral health, psychology, psychiatry um, access especially for people who are uninsured or have Medicaid. Um, and so we wanted to try to address that. There were, you know, 15 or 20 of us at, with all these different ideas of how we could bring together our personal passions and skills to help our community. And the one that really rose to the top um, with good timing and promise uh, was the idea of my now boss colleague, Justine Waldman, who was an ER physician, who, as she would say, was harm reductionized. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and it, from her view in the emergency room, saw that sort of awful rotating door we all know about where people come in in serious trouble, you know, after an overdose or a fight or, um, and, and then, you know, sort of get tidied up and sent home. And then, lack the supports to to make that less likely and so sort of circle back to the emergency room so what justine did sorry motorcycle coming by um, what justine did was better when you lean forward okay sure perfect <laughs> okay um what justine did was um she's been working with the county and with the city of ithaca to bring more harm reduction oriented services to to the local community. She became the physician at the needle exchange at the Southern Tier AIDS program, which is our local needle exchange. Um, for people who aren't familiar with what that is, um, it's, a, it's a foundational tenet of, of harm reduction to help people regardless of where they are on the quest for total health. So if someone is not ready to stop using injection drugs, um, for instance, heroin slash fentanyl, then at least it would be better to use a clean needle and a clean rig so that in the course of doing this admittedly dangerous thing, they aren't also getting hepatitis C or HIV. So a needle exchange is where- Which they can also then pass on to other people. Absolutely. Including their healthcare providers in the emergency room. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I think one of the things that gets me very frustrated when I hear otherwise well-meaning people who are not involved in mm -hmm. healthcare talk about um, their views on needle exchange programs, for example, I just mm -hmm. as one example is, you know, why should we pay for this? Why should we be supporting somebody else's habit? You know, why, right. should, why is this a priority? Yeah, and I think they don't understand that these are our children, these are our neighbors, these are yep. our friends, but these are yep. also vectors of the disease that we're trying to prevent. And we hear yep. this term harm reduction almost as like a buzzword yep. in the opioid epidemic community. Uh, explain to people what harm reduction means aside from just the obvious. 
Sure, sure. And I'm sure that we'll come up with, with multiple examples as we go along. I can try and sort of point them out as we go. Um, let's just start with driving a car at 70 miles an hour. Um, that sounds like a really dumb thing to do, to get in a, a box of metal with wheels and, and drive 70 miles an hour. Um, you know, in 1930, we would have thought that was ridiculous. Um, and somewhere along the line, what was it, 60s or 70s, we got seat belts. And, and seat belts are something that decrease the potential harm of doing a known dangerous thing. And seat belts acknowledge that people are not going to stop using cars. They're going to keep using them. And maybe the speed limits will keep going up even. But in the meantime, seat belts prevent a lot of deaths and injuries. And so that's one I example of you, harm though, reduction. Historically, there was a tremendous backlash to sure. instituting seat belts. And I was you know, a, a young adult at that point. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, also from a historical perspective, the way we got national speed limits was when we had a gas shortage. Uh, so that was during the Carter presidency. And the concept was to limit speed because it maximized <laughs> op or optimized fuel use. Right. So it wasn't fuel really use. just to save lives. Huh. It was mostly to save yeah. lives. Uh, but many times when we're saving lives, we are also saving money. Uh, and Immense that, amounts of money. Immense. So, so talk yeah. to me about needle exchange programs in terms of money. You know, you how bet. much money, yeah. uh, you know, treating one HIV patient could probably right. fund, you know, hundreds and hundreds of needle exchanges. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, needle exchange exchanges are incredibly cheap. I mean, as is relatively the overhead for what we do, um, which is just basically provide talking and a safe space and some prescriptions. Um, so if you think about what comes along in reality with injecting drugs into your body, you are taking a metal needle with a plastic syringe attached, you're putting it through your skin into a blood vessel, and injecting a substance that you may or may not know the exact contents of. That needle, that syringe, any filter you use to inject, to filter whatever you're injecting, if that was used by somebody else, somebody with a high viral load with hepatitis C, or they have HIV but they don't know it and so they have a high viral load, then you're also injecting that. Um, you're also, if you don't clean your skin well, and you put I'm starting to lose your, you a little bit. Try to lean forward half into live the on microphone. Your and don't bother you, but should not go in your, in your bloodstream. Those bacteria can swim through your body. What's that? I started to lose you. So okay. I want okay. you to lean so close. So you're talking about injections and all of the hazards yeah. that people can have from injecting themselves with basically dirty needles or not sterile procedure. Of course, in a yep. hospital, we go to yep. great lengths uh, to do right. sterile procedure. Um, we, you could also inject air. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so one mean? of the very common and on the incredible rise is something called endocarditis, where an infection that often comes from the skin or maybe from the needle or syringe, um, Go, sets up shop on a valve of your heart. Um, and that always means an intensive care unit stay. That often means surgery and advanced imaging and lots of specialists and equipment. So, you know, on average, people estimate that's about $40,000 for a stay. Um, if that person had access to, to clean needles and, you know, a package of alcohol wipes, then there's, there's uh, an immense burden lifted from um, health insurance premiums from, and usually that's from Medicaid, right? So most of the people we treat at REACH, about 80% have Medicaid, either straight Medicaid or managed. Um, and so the, the money that we save by treating people is money that gets reinvested into the healthcare system. Um, 
And so a, a lot of what we do, a lot of the funding we get is because what we're doing is preventing unnecessary emergency room visits, unnecessary hospital admissions. Um, and a lot of these incredibly expensive, very complicated, life-threatening um, infections of the heart that are so expensive to, to pay for. So at the opening of the show, I talked about, of course, the death statistics. People always want to know the death statistics for whatever we're talking about. But we rarely talk about how many people are living with the condition. Yeah. And we rarely talk about the incredible medical uh, consequences or the burden to our healthcare delivery system yeah. for trying to keep, take care of all of these people. And we're taking care of them generally in the most expensive way, which is in emergency rooms and through hospital uh, yep. treatments. And that's true of any condition. You know, if your child has asthma and you go to the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning, it's, the, you know, orders of magnitude more expensive than if you saw the pediatrician earlier that afternoon when it absolutely. Like they were starting to have trouble. So that's true for absolutely any condition. Um, I did not look up the statistics about what the opioid epidemic is costing us in terms of dollars. Do you happen mm -hmm. to know that offhand? I don't. I don't know that offhand. Um, no, but you're, you're making me think that um, it is also very hard to estimate um, even how many people are living with opioid use disorder, mm -hmm. which is a term that I think is much less sort of moralizing, shaming than, than addiction. Um, so w the CDC has estimated that for every overdose death, there are 161 people living with opioid use disorder. Wow. And so some of the statistics that we try to extrapolate are based on that to say, how many people in our region are we trying to reach? Like how many people are out there who need treatment? And how many people is reach reaching? How many how many patients do you have? Yeah, so we've got in in New York State, our little clinic that opened eighteen months ago um, has the most people of any organization on buprenorphine, uh, which is the medication that we primarily use to treat opioid use disorder. Um, it's above seven hundred now, um, and we. And we have more unique patients than that. So I think we're at maybe 12 or 1400 unique patients, but not all of those are seeking care for an opioid use disorder. And you started to say that most of your, or 80% of your patients have Medicaid. Um, mm -hmm. But how else, what fills out the rest of your budget? You know, how else do you, or <laughs> how else are you funded? <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, so we are immensely grant funded. Um, and we knew going in that this was not a money maker. Um, and I, you know, we've all, we've all taken pay cuts to do this work. Um, it would be easy to, easy to make more money doing sort of more standard medicine. Um, but so we have approximately now a $2 million budget. Um, and it's really been a, a skyrocketing growth for REACH. And about 30% of that budget is paid for by health insurance payments. So despite, um, yeah, so um, in general, practices tend to limit the number of Medicaid patients that they see in their practice. Some limit it to 5% or 10%. Um, we see 80 and the next clinic down from us in the county sees about 30%. Um, so we're you know, truly a, a safety net provider. And the way that we've made up that 70% budget gap um, is largely through Medicaid redesign initiatives, which are New York statewide efforts, multi-year efforts, to increase the efficiency of care that is delivered to Medicaid patients. One of their primary markers for that is unnecessary ER visits. So one of the things that our funders are interested in keeping track of is how many, how many people have we kept out of the emergency room by treating them at REACH. Um, and that's, that's a really hard thing to calculate, um, especially early on when you're 
sample size is small. Um, but it, it seems like we've it seems like we've prevented about we've decreased it by about 40 percent already um, and also you know what the 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 worst outcome here is death um, and our the Tompkins County overdose rate went down by 19 percent um, after the first full year that we were open wow. um, yeah so I mean I think and, and certainly that's not all us there are other people that are that are doing you know, wonderful work, um, but I think those numbers are really meaningful, and that we're truly helping a lot of people. So you mentioned drugs that you use to mm -hmm. treat people struggling struggling with um, use disorders. Yeah, um, and this is something I think a lot of people also find controversial, and they hear things and sure. they hear about. Uh, different drugs. Uh, they hear about controversies about whether ambulances should or could carry these various drugs, uh, the availability in emergency rooms, the availability even in high schools. So yeah. you want to start with what are the two basic drug options for treatment yep. with use disorders? Sure. Yeah. So, so the evidence base is really, really strong. Um, and there are, there are two medications that really help save lives for people who are struggling with opioid use disorder. One is methadone, and methadone is a full opioid agonist, which means it just is an opioid. So the, the receptors that we're talking about in our body's nerves are the mu opioid receptors. And so that's where heroin sits, that's where fentanyl sits, that's where morphine sits. Um, and that's where methadone sits. So the, when, when people are treating with methadone, they are usually often observed um, at a methadone clinic with a little cup of liquid methadone. Um, they drink it and they get a sort of slow release, um, hopefully 24 hour um, filling of their opioid receptors which decreases their cravings for other opioids, which are more dangerous to them. So again, reducing harm, harm reduction. Um, methadone is something that we are not licensed to do. There are a lot of hoops to jump through to become a methadone clinic, and that's not the route we went. Um, the medication that we use is called buprenorphine, and most people might have heard of this as Suboxone, which is a, a brand name. Um, that actually combines buprenorphine with naloxone, which is the canceling um, anti-overdose drug uh, that gets in those receptors and blocks blocks the the, the opioids. And, um, and some people might know naloxone as Narcan. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep, yep. Um, and so Narcan is is the sort of it's the easiest life you'll ever save is using Narcan. Um, but buprenorphine is really our sort of bread and butter of, of treatment. Um, and it is what's called a partial agonist. So it gets into those same receptors, those mu opioid receptors, and it binds incredibly tightly. Um, so it's very avid. And, um, but when it gets in there, it's basically, um, it only partly activates those nerves. And so there's a ceiling effect. So if, if all your receptors were filled with this medicine, um, incredibly low chance that you would overdose because sort of after all those receptors are filled, there's no more effect that you can have even if you add more medicine. Um, and so if you're taking buprenorphine because it grabs onto those receptors so tightly, even if you injected heroin, the heroin would have little effect. Um, it would it would displace a little bit of the medicine, but you definitely wouldn't feel the sort of normal um, effects of, of using that medication. Um, so this medicine's delivered usually in films, little dissolvable films that look like sort of the old sticks of chewing gum. Um, and people just sort of stick it um, either under the tongue or in between their gum and cheek. Um, and it dissolves slowly, the medicine goes in, um, and again, it keeps those receptors filled and decreases cravings for, for using other, other drugs. Um, and really, 
my ahead. understanding is that the sub the difference or the main difference between suboxone and and just using uh, naloxone on its own mm -hmm. is that the withdrawal symptoms are mediated a little bit. A little bit, yeah. You can certainly withdraw from you know if you run out of your suboxone, you will withdraw. Um, but because it's that partial agonist, it'll be less painful and awful. Um, but people are intensely physiologically motivated to get their refills, right? <laughs> like it's, it's not a medication that people forget to take. So how long does somebody have to be on this? Um, as long as they want. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, our practice has a lot of themes and one of them is that treatment is driven by the patient. So if, you know, that the World Health Organization recommends long-term, if not lifelong treatment, mm -hmm. um, Right, this is a chronic disease. It's a, it's a chronic brain disease, but it's a chronic disease just like diabetes. And so just like you know, a, a type one diabetic who doesn't make insulin, takes insulin for the rest of their lives, some people, many people who have opiate use disorder take suboxone or methadone for the rest of their lives. And the goal is to help people be as functional and happy and normal and productive um, as, as they can be. And so for a lot of people, that means just staying on this thing that keeps my receptors filled so I can concentrate on what's actually important in life. I think what's also very interesting is, uh, you know, I read this great article uh, that in which you were interviewed, which is what led me to you, uh, where they talked about all the different things that you, tr all the different medical problems that you treat in your patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they have the flu, they have uh, diabetes, they have high blood pressure, they have high cholesterol, they need their routine mammographies and their routine pelvic exams. And oh yeah, they need their suboxone yep. uh, refill. Yeah. 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 And I, that's, that's really what my life is like as a doctor. I'm, we have um, 11 providers at REACH who, who all treat with Zaboxone. Um, and a few of us, uh, three of us do full spectrum primary care. So my panel of patients tends not to be the people who just want treatment for their use disorder. I get the complex primary care patients who were told they had diabetes eight years ago, their blood pressure, isn't quite giving them headaches every day, so they're still ignoring it. They've been kicked out of three medical practices. They haven't had a mammogram for 15 years. They had an abnormal pap 10 years ago, but they were felt too ashamed to go back because they were treated like a junkie. And so really my, my, the, the, the heart of what I do is bringing primary care and the things that we think of as normal self-care in medicine back to people who have been kicked out of that world of care. So Suboxone is the easy part for me, right? It's like, as long as that's in place, then we can get to the rest of this and we can, you know, find your cervical cancer before it's, before it's metastasized somewhere. And um, we can figure out the easiest possible regimen to treat your diabetes so that you can do it consistently. Um, and, you know, I think what, what, what the Suboxone treatment also gives us all space to do is to um, offer and for the patients to be in a place where they're ready to receive social supports. So we have embedded care management in the clinic. We always have free clothing. We always have toiletries. Um, we have toys and books, um, diapers and dog food. I mean, it's everything. And um, I think that's part of why people feel safe and love coming to reach um, is to get, you know, there's always good coffee brewing and donated pastries and fresh broccoli. So um, it, it's- Yeah, I'm it's sure everybody's running in there for the broccoli. There was a run on broccoli this week. So we, got, we got this huge box of broccoli and it was gone in like 45 minutes. <laughs> Um, right. Come for the care, stay for the broccoli. New model totally. in New York. But yeah. in all seriousness, how do patients find you? How do they know about you? Are they referred from the ER? Are they referred from other clinics? Yeah. Um, 
so if you look at through our budget, you'll notice that there's no line for advertisement um, because we haven't needed one. Um, so almost, uh, I'd say an, an enormous, you know, super majority of our patients are just brought in by word of mouth or by a friend. Um, we're, we're strongly affiliated with our partners in town STAP, Southern Tier AIDS program that runs the needle exchange. And so some patients who had been coming there just to do, to get clean needles, um, the staff there said, ooh, now there's a place like us, but they do all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, walk four blocks that way and, and establish care at REACH. Um, but we do have formal linkage programs uh, with our local emergency department. And so there are care managers that are on staff at the hospital. And part of their job is to identify people who come into the ER frequently or come in and are identified as having uh, an opioid use disorder and, and don't have care outside the hospital walls. And so um, we prioritize getting people into reach incredibly quickly. Um, and so it's often a, you know, that day or the next day. And what we don't want is to miss that golden opportunity moment where someone says, yes, I'm ready for help. We don't want to say, hey, great, we'll see you in three weeks at Thursday, on Thursday at three, and don't be late. Because, <laughs> because um, we really want to get people in the minute they're ready. Um, because it's, it's so easy to go back to not being ready. So we got sidetracked when we were talking about your budget and quite honestly, <laughs> the numbers don't add up. Yeah. So you said 80% uh, of your patients have Medicaid, that accounts for 30% of your $2 million budget. Yep. Um, the rest has to come in from grants. Mm -hmm. So among your staff, do you have a grant writer? Or is um, Amy Getson is a, a wizard. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so we have we have now a, a finance department um, with with three people in it. Um, so we have a, a full time finance and strategy person who's one of our founding members, um, and she ha has a real intimate knowledge of um, both different care delivery systems and insurance programs, but also these statewide. Um, uh, in New York, it's called DISRIP, but it, it's the Medicaid redesign program that's trying to make efficiency better for Medicaid patients. Um, and so she has, we were, we've written an immense number of grants um, and gotten some quite large ones that have, that have made this possible. And these are grants to Medicaid and to DISRIP, or this, these are grants to private foundations or all of the above? Or yeah, it's, it's government, you know, tax money that is filtered or directed by a local nine county agency to support a project that we propose will increase the efficiency of Medicaid care, of care for, Medi for people with Medicaid. Um, so we'll say, um, you know, we're doing this project with the hospital where we promise to take the people that they identify as using treatment and get them in quickly. Um, and so that's a really good bet if you were trying to run the budget for Medicaid, okay? That if, if you take some of this money and give it to us up front, and we can engage lots of people that are at risk of death and complications, um, then we're gonna show you that we'll have fewer people go into the ER and spending that money. So we get up, up front lump sums and then report back and say, Hey, look what look at the money we've saved. Look at the good health outcomes we've had, and then hopefully the money just keeps flowing. <laughs> right, and reminding people what you said earlier, I thought this was so impactful when you were talking about endocarditis uh, hospital <laughs> visits. Yeah, that an endocarditis that one endocarditis hospital visit can be forty thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, I have spoken to people, um, you know, who are operating clinics such as yours in other parts of the country. And they have said they are resorting to, you know, bake sales and GoFundMe accounts. Yep. So yep. I guess you're not there yet. Or well, there. <laughs> maybe I skipped that part, Donica. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, we, we're not, we don't have a cushion. Um, and 
we're also committed to, to paying our employees well. We're a living wage employer, and if you have never had a job before and you start working at the front desk, you're gonna make 1511. So we're not skimping in terms of taking care of our own people. Um, and so, you know, we do have individual donors. We started with a basically a GoFundMe, um, um, what do you call it? You know, we, we did a GoFundMe, a drive, um, and made, you know, $10,000 in the two weeks before we opened, um, just so we'd have some little seed money to start with. Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking to more major donors. Um, and there are also some state designations that can help us. So uh, the New York State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, OASIS, um, has a designation where you can get basically enhanced reimbursement. You can get paid more for doing services that they deem really important. Um, so that's something we're, we're working on very soon. Um, you know, another thing is getting certified as an Article 28 facility, which basically means like many Planned Parenthood buildings, that you can charge um, facility fees as well as your service fees. So um, one of the reasons that you know a hospital is so expensive is that they can charge more because it's in a certain kind of zoned building. Um, and it, so it would allow us to get enhanced reimbursement for some of those things that are not covered under OASIS certification. Um, but yeah, we're still very much in the active phase of looking for a path to sustainability. Um, you know, we don't have a, a big, you know, nest egg that's growing in the background. Um, and we're a loan repayment site. So personally, that helps me. I just um, got awarded a three year loan repayment um, grant from the federal government, the same okay. people that paid for part of medical school. Um, so there that's, you know, I, I pay about $1,200 a month in student loan payments. Wow. And yeah, and for three, <laughs> and for three years, that's basically going to be waived. Um, so a big chunk is that, of is that three year award. You know, this is another issue we hear a lot mm -hmm. about. Of course, a student mm -hmm. loan repayment. Yeah, I paid four hundred dollars a month back in the day for ten, mm -hmm. years, uh, and I'm staggered by the amount of debt that um, you know yeah. directors today have. So is this a three year uh, commitment or waiver? Is this uh, a year for year kind of a deal, or is this um, just three years outright? Um, it's is this, it, there's, that, is this giving you money for time served? <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I promise to stay in this business of serving people with substance use disorders for the next three years, which is the plan anyway. Um, and I, I get an upfront chunk of change to go to my loan services. So okay. I pay off, you know, $37,000. Um, and so then my, my future payments will go down. So uh, is the GoFundMe page still active? There, there's not an active GoFundMe page. We have, um, we're a nonprofit and we have um, a donation site on our website. So it is Reach Project Inc. I-N-C. Dot org, uh, and then you can get you, if you scroll down, you'll get to the donate box. If you want to just type it in, it's reachprojectinc.org backslash donate. Um, but you know, if you're one of those major funders who wants to actually <laughs> you know, talk to someone about this, um, then I would just get, get in touch with with one of the management folks who's on uh, whose contact info is on that page. Got it. You, it's amazing what our reach is. Uh, I want to switch gears with you a little bit now, and I want to talk about what pisses you off. Um, whew. Uh, in we terms already of, talked about the budget shortfall. We're, we'll yeah, cross that off the list. Yeah. Um, one of the things that pisses me off is how hard it is to do this when the medicine is easy and the evidence is good. Um, there is a rule, there's a law in our country that says you can't treat an opioid problem with an opioid. Um, harking back to what are the two drugs we use to treat this disease, 
they're both opioids. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in my line of work where we're trying to use suboxone, buprenorphine to treat, to treat opioid use disorder, I had to go through a special training online, pay several hundred dollars, and apply to the government for a waiver to this rule to allow me the privilege of using buprenorphine to save people's lives and improve them. When I got that waiver, I was allowed to prescribe Suboxone to 30, three zero patients concurrently for the first year. Wow. In the meantime, I can, I can write Oxycontin for whoever I want. Nobody, you know, I'm not saying nobody's watching, right? Like they don't, um, but, but there's so much, um, that it's a logistical nightmare. And why is this? Great question. Um, Be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't fully understand it. Um, and, I, and I also know that at the federal level, they're doing some things to lift these restrictions. So the way it used to work is that the, for the first year, you could prescribe to 30 people. For the second year, if you applied, you could bump that up to 100. And then um, if, you've, if you're doing a lot of this kind of work, you can apply after two years to have 275 wavered slots. So concurrent patients. Um, so this means that we operate a very nurse heavy practice where nurses have a, are really working at the top of their game and we really have you know, smart, awesome, dedicated ones who are great at communication because we gotta beat this system. And so that is what pisses me off, that like there's a system to beat. And is that, there any other drug category that you can think of that has this kind of procedure other than, I think the only thing I can think of is perhaps medical marijuana, where you have to have a special yep. designation uh, in yep. certain states to dispense yep. marijuana. Yeah, though that's easier right also. There. Yeah, and you know, I think there, there are special protections on some chemo agents, but um, nothing that I've used in, in uh, family practice. So no, this is, this is completely unique. Um, and there's a big national campaign. If you you know go on Twitter or Facebook or somewhere, you can you can find X the X waiver. So this waiver, it's called the X waiver or the Data 2000 waiver. Um, and a lot of us just want to do away with it. Like, why are we limiting the thing that could help cut this death crisis short? Um, is this and something so that Congress has to overturn, or is this something that's at the level of? The FDA or HSS? It, HHS? Yeah, yeah, I, I can't, I can't answer that actually. Um, I, honestly, I've been sort of too busy head down to figure out exactly who's in charge of that one. Um, <laughs> um, but it these is are the, these are the kinds of things, and and this yeah. is what I wanted to get at in this discussion. Yeah, these are the. I get so frustrated as somebody who's not in, in a providing care to mm -hmm. patients these disorders, just as somebody who reads the newspaper and listens to the news and who happens to be a physician, I get so frustrated when I hear politicians uh, recommending and passing laws that are designed to, you know, impact the opioid crisis, right. that have nothing to do with the problem, right. that just create additional hoops uh, that we have to jump through. And I yep. also have a different perspective on it as a patient. I have mm -hmm. a long history of severe chronic pain. I have never had a substance abuse problem. Mm -hmm. I take one narcotic pill every yep. two to four weeks, maybe when I can't <laughs> take it anymore. Yep. But in New Jersey, what I now have to go through as a patient to get that prescription and what my physician has to go through to write that prescription. Yeah is ridiculous. One of the things is a four page contract that I have to sign, like Good that Lord. can't do anything. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is a urine test that I have to have in order to get my prescription renewed. And I said to my primary care physician, what's the point of this test? Yeah. The point to see that I'm taking the medication? Because if so, my urine test will probably be negative because I only right. take one pill like every four weeks. Right. Um, I said, is, or is the point to see if I'm taking multiple substances? Right. And she said, my doctor, who's you know, a Harvard-trained internist who's been you know, in practice for many years, she says, I have no idea. Pee in the cup and let's just do this. Right. Right. So she's ordering a test that she doesn't even know what the answer is supposed to be. Right. Is it right. supposed to be positive? Is it supposed to be negative? 
Yeah. Um, and that, of course, is at additional cost because yep. your insurance company doesn't pay for that. Yep. So it's a ridiculous hoop uh, and process. And so most of the time, it's easier for me to just be in pain than to take this. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, and if you think about the um, pendulum as well. Absolutely. Right. And, and so I think, you know, I've had a big mind shift over the last few years as I've gone from to traditional family practice to doing a lot of this addiction medicine. Um, and certainly for lots of us, it's just routine. Like, okay, we're, you know, periodically when we're prescribing controlled substances, we should get a urine drug screen. Like, you know, insurance might remind us to, or we think we want to cover our butts. Um, and, you know, the more I've thought deeply about this and thought about it in terms of, you know, my high school colleagues that are coming to see me as, as their physician and, you know, the people that I, I get really close to and talk about very vulnerable, intimate things with, the process of, of you know, testing their pee when they come in to chat about things that, that are hard <laughs> is really just an added barrier to a trusting relationship. Um, well, it also, it doesn't make any impact on how, what kind of care you're providing. You and bet. And the crappy test. It as a patient, <laughs> except it's just a nuisance. Yeah. And it's expensive. It cost me $163 for this test. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's yep. annoying. It's annoying. And it's, it's, it's fraught with errors, too. So, you know, urine drug screens have all sorts of false positives and, and false negatives. So it, it's not even a good test. Um, so I think we would be misinformed if we paid a lot of attention to it. I, the, you know, I, I don't want someone, if I'm giving them 60 Suboxones for a month, I don't want them selling all of those on the street. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the person I'm prescribing them is mostly the person who's taking them. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, besides that, like, I, I think mostly it's used as, um, evidence for punishment um, and in, in a lot of drug treatment facilities if even if you have you know THC from marijuana in your urine you might get kicked out of treatment and to me this is ridiculous so let's say you know let's say someone is trying not to use heroin because they want to be a better dad they want to um, you know, be able to read books and build a chicken coop and um, do a good job at their job. Um, they have a disease. And so if, if I get a pee cup that says there's heroin in this person's body and then I kick them out for using drugs, I'm basically saying, I was trying to treat you for a disease and then I'm going to get rid of you because you have that disease. <laughs> right? So it's, it's just a sign that you know, we need to have a conversation. And yeah, can you imagine if we kicked uh, people with diabetes out of our practices if their hemoglobin A1C was elevated? <laughs> right, right. Or like, ooh, I saw you at Dunkin' Donuts. Like, you're out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so what else pisses you off? Talk to me uh, like I'm your assembly woman. Yeah, great. Uh, prior <laughs> authorizations piss me off. Mm -hmm. So I was talking about this, this golden opportunity when someone presents and says, I'm ready for treatment. Um, I want to be able to give them the medicine that is not heroin right then. I want them to leave the office. I want to send the script electronically to their neighborhood pharmacy. I want them to pick it up and take it. Too often, we'll send a prescription, and I can't even see the result of this, but when the pharmacy gets that prescription, and submits the charge to insurance. Insurance sends something back saying, nope, we need more, we, we need a better argument. Like we need to make sure that you can't use something else or we don't wanna pay for this right now. And so there can be, um, where we are, there's a, a limit on these medications that say, we can't delay this more than 24 hours. The insurance can't delay that request for prior authorization. Um, so if you put in the request and say, no, really, I want them to have this, and I'm, I'm willing to write a brand name, a generic, whatever you want me to, but 
you know, I, I want them to have this today because the other alternative is, is them injecting heroin. Um, there should be no prior authorization. This is a medication. I mean, on most days, I just wish it were in vending machines. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it is so ridiculous that there, are, that there are hurdles to jump through for something that is so based in evidence, so much less harmful than the alternative, which is drug use. Um, I don't care if people give a little bit to their friends. You know, I, I probably shouldn't say that at your ladies' room, but, <laughs> but, I, I, <laughs> um, but you know, what's, what's the alternative? Right. This medicine isn't isn't harming people, right? Do I wish that nobody had to be on it? Absolutely. Am I in charge of that? Not at all. I, speaking of giving a little to their friends, I actually, um, speaking of ladies' room stories, I just thought of this. I had totally forgotten about this. I was on vacation in Hawaii a couple of years ago at, at a very nice touristy kind of place, and they had a lovely-looking building that was a public restroom. And I went to use, I went, started walking over to the, use the ladies room and a young police officer came over to me and I look like your average blonde, you know, suburban housewife type. <laughs> and he came over to me and he said, are you going to the ladies room? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I recommend that you use one in a restaurant or somewhere, you know, <laughs> nearby, don't use this one. And I said, why? And he said, oh, there's a lot of people who use this restroom to do heroin. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this was the weirdest thing that this policeman was protecting me from going in to the right. restroom. So right. I couldn't encounter people who were doing heroin in the ladies room, right. but yeah. not taking care of the people in the ladies room yeah. who were doing heroin. Yeah. Yep. And I just thought that was the oddest thing. Of course, I just told him I thought that was the oddest thing. And I went to mm -hmm. a local restaurant and used sure. their ladies room instead. Right. That was right. Odd. So... As far as, we, we just have time for one more thing that pisses you off, and I want to lead you to what I hope it might be. Okay. I want you to explain to people, what is this issue? Why is it a problem for people like suburban housewife parents mm -hmm. whose children are known to be addicts or known to have a substance use disorder that they can't get? Narcan or uh, Suboxone to have in their house in case of emergency. Explain to us what that's all about. Why is it hard to get Narcan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Suboxone, because of course, yeah. one of the big differences we didn't talk about between Narcan and Suboxone is that Suboxone mm -hmm. is not, does not require an injection. Narcan right. requires an injection. Right. Or an, it, mostly it's in nasal sprays now. So there, so, um, the, 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 the Narcan, which is the one that just blocks the receptors so that no opioid effect can, can happen, um, is about the safest drug you could ever use. Um, and it is, when I was a paramedic, we, it was pretty much only um, intramuscular. You had to use a needle and poke it into somebody's body. Um, now we have these nasal sprays that are like, I mean, it looks like Flonase. You know, it looks like you just have some allergies. Um, and it, it really is the easiest life you could ever save. And it should be on every street corner. It should be on every school. And why is this controversial? Say my friend has yep. a uh, you know, young adult child who yep. is struggling uh, with a substance use problem and they've had scares before, why yeah. can't they just have that in their house in case? Yeah. The same way I have an EpiPen in right. my house um, right because I have an adult child who had an allergy that she hasn't had a problem with t for 10 years, but right. just in case, totally. I have the EpiPen. Totally, yeah. Um, so I think, I think th there must be places where it is actually hard to get, where, they're, where it's really expensive or limitations on it. We give Narcan to everybody. So um, there are many pharmacies now where even without a prescription, you can walk in and say, just as a public safety measure, can I please have some Narcan? Really? Yeah. And okay. so the pharmacists need to do a little extra training. It's like a little CME um, or CPE, whatever they call them. <laughs> um, but also any prescribing provider can just prescribe Narcan. To so have it in the house just in case. Just to have it, right? I keep one in my backpack. I keep and one in my car. Can act much more quickly than Suboxone. Yep, yep. And so Suboxone will not 
will not um, effectively bring someone back from a bad opioid overdose. So if someone, you know, got carfentanil in their heroin and so got a huge dose of opioids, you don't want to give them Suboxone. You want to give them a lot of Narcan. Um, and, you know, it may take several squirts. Um, if there's such a thing as giving somebody too much Narcan. No, they're, they will withdraw and feel awful and hate you and they will be alive. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you know what? I think that's a, that's a great place to draw to a close um, yeah. because I think, you know, certainly my friends who've lost adult children um, yeah. to overdoses um, would, would do anything if yeah. they could have that experience of having their child alone. In fact, one of my friends, I, I said to her, it's been a few years now, and I said to her one Mother's Day, is it better for you or worse for you if I mention him? Mm -hmm. And she said, it doesn't matter because don't think I'm not thinking about him every yeah. minute of the day. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that she said to me that I thought was just so illuminating to somebody who, thank God, has not had to deal with this problem in someone in my family. Um, and she said to me, the worst thing is I will never know if he intended to kill himself or yeah. if he accidentally overdosed. Yeah. Um, and she yeah. said what pisses her off is this idea of talking about heroin overdoses or opioid overdoses as mm -hmm. though there's some safe dosage that's okay. Right. right. You know, that it's right. a usage problem, not a dosage problem. Yeah. 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 I have, I have two people in, in my close life, um, one family, one friend who I, I also will never know. We'll never know. Um, you know, what happened in those last moments and how many pills were taken intentionally and what, what was the, what was the goal when, when taken? Um, yeah. And there, there's no getting those people back. There's no asking. And so if we continue public policy that is aimed at punishing incarceration, yeah, um, we're, we're just never going to get there. We need to treat, not punish. And we need to love these people up and do our best medicine. Well, thank you so much for all of the great work that you do on a daily basis, loving people up and also <laughs> practicing your best medicine. Uh, but thank you also just so much for sharing with us your insights, because I think that the more people who understand this problem, yeah. uh, the more people can put pressure on their assembly members and their congress members and try to get rid of these things that don't make sense and if and institute effective public policies that are really aimed at addressing what the real problem is yeah thank and you so keep, much for, keep for fighting talking. the good fight where can yeah. people find you online yeah so we are at reachprojectinc.org um, and uh, we're on the corner of Cayuga and Court if you just want to come to Ithaca. <laughs> if you just want to come in and get some broccoli. Yeah, come get your broccoli. <laughs> Take care. Keep eating your Thanks broccoli. So That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.